Okay. I break the rules down into four units. They seem to be some very logical way of looking at the rules. And I've been doing this now for about 10 years. And in the last three classes I've had, um, we've had an excess of like 30, 35 people. We've only had three people had to redo the rules. So I feel pretty good in how we're doing it and how we're teaching it. Obviously, we're talking rules of the road, navigation rules of the road. that are outlined in, in 33 CFR. The items that are highlighted in red are going to be the international only rules. Because you're taking the exam for near coastal, it's in cold, closed, include, excuse me, both inland and international rules. The other thing I like to always bring up is these rules only make sense if you put yourself in a 100 foot boat, 100 ton vessel. A lot of people that I have in my classes uh, have small boats, 20 foot, 25 foot, and they have a hard time relating to the rules because they have small boats, a lot of exemptions with those small boats. So the biggest thing is to look at uh, that you're in a larger boat, again, 100 foot long, then a lot of the stuff seems to make a lot more sense. What purpose of the rules? To avoid collision. In fact, I suggest if you haven't, pull out our um, rules book. And this, this, the PowerPoints are going to follow right along in the rules book very uh, closely. In fact, the way it's written up is pretty close to what I have here in our PowerPoints. So the purpose of the rules is to avoid collision with other objects and vessels. Again, if we didn't have to be concerned with rules of uh, uh, collisions, we wouldn't have to have rules of the road. The rules are divided into two areas, international and inland, and they're separated by the Colregs line. So in my inland course, they have to stay on the inside of the Colregs line. With this course, we can go on either side. And you'll see them listed at most of bays, uh, harbors, um, off in Chesapeake Bay, out just beyond the bridge will be one. Uh, down in Florida, a lot of the little harbors, you'll see the line that co-regs. Inside is inland rules, outside is international rules. Um, that's why a lot of people that run intercoastal can run it with an inland license. International rules formalized in 1972 by uh, host of nations. And again, these things are uh, updated over time. Inland rules. We brought together a lot of the old rules into one uniform uh, package. Uh, Western Rivers, Old Inland, Great Lakes rules, uh, et cetera. Uh, people don't realize that up until I think it was the late 70s, early 80s, we still had black buoys on the Great Lakes and where they went over to the red and green. Again, we try to uniform, bring everything into a uniform package. 38 rules, five annexes. Uh, we're only going to be talking about one of the annexes inland. The other ones give you a lot of guidance on things such as sounds and the like, but it's really not part of this course. Um, we're going to concentrate on inland slash inland international. And where there's international only, I'm going to highlight those. We group them into a host of areas. The first one's general definitions. Four through ten are any conditions. Basically, when we're underway, these rules apply. Eleven through eighteen is when I can see you. The big thing here is I got to be able to see you with my eyes, not radar, not AIS. I got to see you with my eyes. If I cannot see you with my eyes, these rules do not apply. Restricted visibility. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about use of radar. Many people do not have radar, so we'll talk about uh, the more common option that we use in restricted visibility. Now. 1 through 19 are basically what I call our highway rules. It's how we drive our boats, how we give way to other boats, et cetera. Then the following rules, 20 to 31 and 20, 32 to 37, basically 36, are simply rules on, uh, to help identify who you are, which way you're going, and our priority. So the first rules set of rules tells us how we're going to react to each other. 20 to 36 tells us how do I know who you are. And when you break that down that way, it seems to make a lot more sense on the rules and seems a lot more easier, easier to understand them. 
38 exceptions. And then the various annex, we're just going to be talking about parts of one of them. You gentlemen have a pretty good idea of size of boats, but everything's done in meters. So it gives you an idea. Uh, 12 meter boats, 40 footers, uh, it's one of the big breaks. 50 foot, uh, 50 meters, difference in shapes and lights. 100 meters, same thing. Okay, first couple rules. Rule one. International rules apply to all vessels upon the high seas and in all waters connecting therein navigable by seagoing vessels. So if a vessel is out on the ocean and comes into the Great Lakes, they're in compliant with their, as long as they're in compliant with international rules, they're compliant with our local uh, inland rules. Inland rules, basically everything inside uh, the Coregs line, as long as it does not conflict with Canadian waters. It goes on to say that special rules can be developed by the Secretary of the Navy related to warships and uh, fishing fleets, published in federal regulations, and there's a number of them that are out there. Homeland Security now can give uh, some variations, some exemptions to lights and shapes. So rule one simply does divide the rules into inland and into international, and then uh, basically gives the secretaries of the Homeland Security Navy to make uh, alterations into those rules necessary for their individual groups. Pretty straightforward. Rule two, in my estimation, is probably one of the most important rules that we have because it says nothing in the rules are exonerate any vessel, owner, master, or crew from any consequence of any neglect to comply with these rules or the neglect of any precautions which may be required by the practice, ordinary practice of semen. Basically it says, you're going to be a mariner out there, you need to comply with these rules and common sense. Because if you don't apply common sense, you can very easily be considered negligent in carrying out those practices. Uh, we had two uh, lieutenants come into my last class from the Coast Guard and we were talking about this and others. And our biggest point is it's not so much that uh, the Coast Guard is going to get you. It's the fact that if you're negligent out there, you open yourself up to a lot of litigation, and including, again, we're back to the owner of the vessel, even though they may not be on it, if they are aware of these uh, actions, these negligence, they can be held just as responsible as the people on the boat itself. Or by circum special circumstance of the case, normally special circumstances is considered when we have more than... Uh, two boats uh, coming together. Again, very powerful um, provision of the rules. He goes on to say it's not just the rules themselves, but again, common sense that we must use. Compliance with the rules do uh, all shall be, you know, again, we're trying to avoid collisions, special circumstances, multiple vessels that are involved. And here's the, one of the bigger parts of this rule too. One can we depart from the rules only in immediate danger. We're obligated to comply with the rules up to the point where if we don't take an action, there's going to be a collision. We depart from the rules in immediate danger. Again, you know, you're always going to take an action if uh, at all possible to avoid that collision. At least a competent mariner will. Common sense. So our first rule gives us our definitions of inland versus in, uh, international. We have our core line. The second rule says basically we're going to comply with these rules and common sense. However, we can deviate from the rules, again, in immediate danger. So again, it provides us a, a background on what we're operating under. Rule three gives us some general def uh, some, gen uh, some definitions that we're going to be using throughout the, uh, the review of these rules. Vessel, if it floats, it's a boat, except, of course, if it's your home, then Supreme Court says it's not a boat. Power driven, propelled by machinery. So if I'm out there with my 17 foot canoe and my Mankato 65 on her, uh, I'm a power driven vessel. So and I must comply with those particular set of rules. Sailing vessels I mean any vessel under sail provided that the power uh, propelling machinery is not being used. It's a sailboat only when the motors are off. 
If the sails are up and the motor is on, we are motor sailing, we are a power-driven vessel. Uh, it's a point I really hammer home to people that sailboats are only sailboats when sails are up and the motor's off. Engaged in fishing, where we have our nets, lines, are restricting our mobility. It does not make us restricting ability to maneuver. It's simply how we differentiate between a fishing vessel and a non-fishing vessel is that their equipment makes it hard for them to maneuver and comply with the rules. Trawling, obviously, uh, is not fishing. By definition, seaplane planes that land on the water, not under command, by some special circumstances, unable to comply with the rules. The boat's broke. Um, a couple of examples that I come up with: um, a couple of years ago, we had an ore carrier come into Sturgeon Bay, um, and the engine malfunctioned. Boat's going 15 knots. Tugboats go out to pick it up. It's actually going so fast. They can't get the lines on it. It's not under command because it has no propulsion, but it's still moving. So just because something is not under command does not mean it's not making way. It simply says it can't comply with the rules. Restricted ability to maneuver. Why? By the nature of our work. These are the boats that are out there working, and I equate that to the people on the highway that are filling in the potholes. They're doing work on the roads. These guys are doing work out on the water. Moving people from point A to point B is not construed as work. What work means is they're doing uh, underground, underwater operations, dredging, surveying, uh, transferring people, provisions, cargo. In this particular case, we're looking at uh, uh, transferring a fuel. Obviously, these boats are restricted. Why? By the nature of their work. They're moving uh, fuel back and forth. Launching aircraft, mine clearing operations, servicing uh, navigational buoys. Obviously, these people cannot get out of other boats' ways, so they are restricted. Why? By the nature of their work. In sight of one another, if I can see you with my eyes, you're in sight of the other boat. If I cannot, we're restricted visibility. Again, restricted visibility means conditions where visibility is restricted by fog, mist, snow, heavy rains, fireworks, sandstorms, anything that's out there in which we cannot observe the other boats. Darkness is not restricted visibility. We can see the other boat lights. Underway, not anchored, moored, or ground. If we're floating free, we're underway. And one of the things that uh, a lot of students don't understand is, is the difference between making way and underway, but the rules apply if you're not moving out there just as much as if you are moving. If you're floating free, these the set of rules apply to you. And that's where we have uh, people approach you from the starboard side and people say, well, I'm not moving. I don't have to get out of the way. Not true. If they approach us from a way which we're the giveaway boat, even if we're not making way, we have to honor that. So underway is not anchored, moored, or ground. Western rivers, water flows into the Mississippi. Great Lakes, uh, Great Lakes and the interconnecting uh, river systems. Inland waters, navigable waters of the U.S. shore to demarcation line, harbors, rivers, bays, inland waters, etc. Includes uh, a lot of areas. Constraint by draft. This is the only vessel that is international only. It's a big boat, big draft, and must stay within a defined channel. If it wants to claim that status, it runs up the particular day shapes and lights. But it is only has its status in international uh, rules area, which means it's uh, seaward of the Corregs line. Big boats. They have a hard time uh, with. Uh, their maneuverability, they got to stay within those channels. Wings and grounds, uh, these are planes that fly on the water interface. Most of the stuff is more European. Um, they're treated as power driven vessels. I've not seen them, I've not heard of them here. Uh, again, from what I know, they tend to be more European in nature. So we got our first three rules help sets the framework. What's inland, what's international rules, 
Um, we have to comply with the rules. When can we deviate, deviate immediate danger? And it gives us some definitions. So it gives us the basic structure we need to follow through on the next set of rules, which are basically any conditions of visibility. If we're underway, these rules apply. And the key word there is any, day, night, restricted. Once that the last line has left the dock and that boat's floating free, these rules um, come into being. Rule five, every vessel should at all times maintain proper lookout by sight and hearing. By sight and hearing is what we're maintaining our proper lookout. To do what? By using other appropriate means in the prevailing circumstances and conditions, which means if you have radar, the condition determines radar should be used, you better know how to use it. And we're going to make a full appraisal of the situation and the risk of collision. So our lookout is out there by sight and hearing to determine if there is a risk of collision. And on a lot of boats, the master is also the lookout, which means they don't do a very good job of watching for other boats, and we have a lot more accidents. Uh, a lot of times, especially on a little bit bigger boats, you got to have your designated lookout, so they're doing their job while the helm is doing theirs. Key items. Sight and hearing at all times, full appraisal, and all means appropriate to the prevailing conditions. Big question I have if you're teaching sailing, catching fish, whatever, who's your lookout? When I used to teach sailing uh, by myself, I'd have two, three people on board. If I had to focus on one of the students, the first thing I would do is to tell the other student, you're my lookout. Watch, make sure that we don't run into things. I would focus on a particular situation. Thank the person for being my lookout, then I assume those duties. But we always made sure that somebody was the designated lookout at all times. Again, radar is not an acceptable means for lookout. It's an uh, additional tool, but it's only a tool. Old data, but it really brings home the point. Uh, operational uh, inattention, 700 incidences, no proper lookout, 300 incidences, over 1,000 cases, 78 people died because they were not paying attention. A lack of a lookout out there is, is very one of the major causes for these accidents. I love Florida. Florida is a great place. Uh, no hands on the wheels. No one's watching where they're going. A very typical situation from recreational boaters. Um, not good. The other situation we had, um, it's been four years ago now, is where, again, somebody was not watching. We had a disabled uh, vessel out there. They ended up getting run over. Two people ended up dying from it. And what they found out is that the operator was in the lower wheelhouse, limited visibility, and on the laptop and cell phone. And basically, we get into wheelhouse distraction, which is becoming more and more of an issue. Uh, on some of these bigger um, yachts and that, all you see is displays. It's actually hard sometimes to even look out the window and see what's going on. And I really like to harp on this that, you know, wheelhouse distraction, cell phones are one of the big contributors be it on the road or on the water, something that we need to be very uh, conscious of. So we have our lookout. The next thing we have is safe speed. And the key thing there is what is safe speed? It's where we can take appropriate, a proper rather than effective action to avoid a collision and to stop within the distances appropriate for the uh, prevailing circumstances and conditions. So safe speed says we got to be able to do two things. Take an evasive action to avoid a collision and stop in time to avoid a collision. So those are the two conditions. So what are the, the factors involved? Visibility. Is it a clear day or is it overcast? We got pretty miserable overcast day today. Reduces our visibility. Traffic density. A nice quiet day out on uh, the bay or is there a fishing tournament? We got about 300 walleye fishermen out there. Big difference on how fast you're gonna go. Fourth of July, uh, high traffic density it's going to dictate how fast we can safely go so that we can avoid a collision by either taking appropriate action or stopping. Maneuverability. 
we're in a 100-foot boat. We're in a 100-ton vessel. We're not in a 22-foot boat. They don't turn as quick. They don't stop as quick. So, again, that has a major factor in how fast we can go. Background lights, uh, going to Chicago, big thrill. Uh, is that red light a buoy, a boat, a stoplight, a car, what? And it becomes, uh, because it's so two-dimensional, it's not three-dimensional, you really have to slow down and watch. So background lights um, can really cause a lot of um, safety factors on it. So we have to slow down appropriately. State of the wind, sea and current. Uh, calm, flat days, you know, big waves, big winds, all dictate how fast we can go. Spring melt, especially in the river systems, a lot of logs floating down, a lot of material floating down. It's going to dictate how fast that we can uh, we can go. A number of years ago, we had um, uh, one of the barges out in Lake Michigan drop a bunch of telephone poles. Obviously, in those areas, there were a lot of navigational hazards, which required uh, a different... Uh, set of speeds, draft of the vessel to uh, the depth of water. Visibility, maneuverability, traffic densities, background lights, state of the wind, sea, and current. So we have our lookout. We have determined what is safe speed. The next thing we run into is what's the risk? What's the risk of collision? Every vessel shall use all appropriate means, again, for the prevailing circumstances to determine if there's a risk talked about that before. If there's any doubt, we assume risk exists. It doesn't say we got to do a lot of crazy actions. It simply says assume that there's risk of a collision and then evaluate what actions you can take to mitigate that risk. Long scan radar, to obtain early uh, warning. Uh, what we did here is we're going up to, uh, taking a boat up to Canada and we spotted a freighter out uh, some distance, beautiful day, put on a ranging circle and a bearing line, and we could watch that boat come right down the bearing line towards us. Obviously, we stopped, big freighter, let it go ahead of us when we met. But it was interesting to watch with these long-range uh, scans, and it can really help out determine if there is that risk of collision. And again, plot uh, some system to make uh, systematic observations. Get yeah, radar, you should know how to use it. Uh, the more common way we do this is if an approaching vessel's compass bearing does not appreciably change. It means if the compass bearing to that vessel does not change, but the range is decreasing, obviously we have a risk of collision. All you have to do is think of uh, the on-ramps off a highway, and you see a car coming down that on-ramp, and it's matching your speed. You know at the end of that ramp, you and that car are going to be meeting. We have a risk of collision. If the range is same, bearing's constant, they're going parallel to us. If the range is increasing and the bearing's constant, they're going away from us. But with a decreasing range, constant bearing, we do have that risk of collision. And it's something people just don't watch. Of course, we have big boats, large vessels, tows, close range, Obviously, the, the bearing can change to some degree and still a risk of collision. But the main thing is when we're out there, I always watch for that boat. And if I see it in the same spot on the, the boat a couple times, I know we have a, a constant bearing. I guess I will take action and to make sure that we do not have collision. So what do we do to avoid a collision? We have a lookout. We have got safe speed. We determine there is a risk of collision. So now what are we going to do? Any action taken to avoid is going to be positive, ample time. We're not going to wait till the last minute. And due regard to good seamanship, common sense, like we talked about in Rule 2. Altering course of speed to avoid collision shall be large and apparent to the other vessel by visual or by radar. We don't want them uh, second-guessing what we're doing. If I'm going 20 knots, I'm going to drop down to 15, maybe to 10. If I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn at least 15 to 20 degrees so there's, there's a very apparent to that other boat what I'm doing. Small alterations, of course, the speed should be avoided. Again, big enough so that the other people can see it. 
if there's sufficient room, authoring course alone, a lot of times that's all we have to do, uh, provided it's done in a way that we don't cause a close quarter situation with another boat. The same thing is just reducing speed. Uh, a lot of times if we slow down, again, enough so that the other person knows what we're doing, uh, it's all we really have to do to avoid a um, close quarter situation. Big thing here, when taking an action, we don't cross in front of the other person. We always want to make sure we cross behind them and that we do it in a way that there's safe uh, distances uh, between the boats. Carefully continue to check until we're past and clear. Again, very much common sense approach. Early, good seamanship, positive, taking an action that's large enough so that the other people know what we're doing. Okay. Um, again, slack and speed take. I don't like to take all the way off. If you take all the way off, you have no steerage. Again, in an all port situation with the um, um, inboard engines, it's totally different. You need speed uh, water flowing over that rudder to make changes. And if you have no way on, it's pretty hard to make that change. Need time again. Normally, you can't go wrong by slowing down. Look out, say speed, we determined there's a risk, and now we got um, we took appropriate action to avoid that risk. Narrow channels. We normally stay to the starboard, not to the right, but we stay to the starboard of the vessel as close as we can. It's safe and practical. Here's a boat coming out of Miami. Uh, saw the government cut. He's about as far over as he can safely be uh, not to run aground. You can see the buoys in the background. So again, you stay in the starboard, safe and practical. There's a unique set of rules for power driven on the Great Lakes, Western Rivers, for waters designated by the Secretary. And you will note right away that these are power driven vessels. One of the conditions. So a power driven vessel proceeding downbound with a following current. These are big boats, they're not gonna stop. We got a lot of water pushing them down. They do not have the means to uh, uh, means to slow down, and much less, uh, you know, very difficult to control these boats, especially in those conditions with falling current. They have a right away over an upbound vessel, provided they propose the manner and place the passage, and initiate the maneuvering signals as appropriate. So downbound, Western Rivers, Great Lakes, designated as secretary. Power driven with the following current, they have the right of way. It's the only boat, the entire set of rules that actually has a designated as having the right of way. So they have the right of way if they propose to place the manner of passage and initiate the signals. And the way they're initiating the signals nowadays, of course, is by radio. We don't hear too much of the, the horns out there, whistles out there. Vessels proceeding not bound against the following current shall hold as necessary to permit the safe passage. And again, here's a situation, a uh, large barge, set of barges coming up. They lack maneuverability, uh, especially with that following current. Power driven, down, downbound, long as they say place the manner of passage, initiate the signals, have the right away of up any upbound vessels. Not any other downbound, but only the other upbound vessels. So a couple other situations in narrow channels. Vessels less than 20 meters in length. Sailing vessels or sailing vessels shall not impede the passes of a vessel that can only safely navigate within a channel or fairway. So anything under 20 meters or sailing will not impede the passage of another vessel in a narrow channel. Makes sense. So this guy here bounces his boat off of this uh, Freighter two weekends in a row, and the captain does not much he could have done, but uh, you know he just maintained his operations, and the, the boat had to finally get out of its way. It's just people don't have a lot of common sense sometimes to know what they're doing. Okay, they also shall not engage in commercial fishing; shall not impede the passage within a narrow channel. It doesn't say they can't fish there. It simply says that they cannot impede the passage of another boat coming in. Nor shall any boat, uh, you know, that has to stay in a narrow channel, 
uh, impede their passage by crossing. So we, here we, again, we have a lake freighter coming in, and we cannot impede their passage by crossing them or by anchoring in the narrow channel itself. So again, we have the downbound scenario. We have a scenario that within a narrow channel, small boats, less than 20 meters, or those that are sailing are not going to impede the passage of a vessel. They have to stay within the channel, nor are we going to impede uh, their passage by fishing, commercial fishing, crossing, or anchoring. Our first saw, uh, sound signal. We'll talk a lot about those in about two more lectures. Um, around the bend, we cannot see it. Your radar is not going to see around the bend. Uh, we initiate the prolong so that we can let people know where, uh, where we are. In this case here, this is down in uh, the Everglades. And when he leaves, he goes around an area where there's a lot of trees. People can't see him, a lot of recreational boaters. He will sound that prolong to let people know that he's there. To avoid again, um, minimize the risk of collision. The last one I'm going to cover before we go to the next one is traffic separation zones. These are schemes very much like our highways. They move, uh, they move traffic in one direction in crowded areas. Instead of painted highways, lines, we got buoys and, and charts. Uh, again, they does not rely upon uh, or relieve them of following any other rules that may be out there. Now, our big thing on traffic sep zones, if in our smaller boats, we're not supposed to be there. If we're going to cross them, we cross at a 90 degree angle after we let the traffic uh, control people know what we're doing. For the most part, we're staying out of those areas. We have our boats are too small to be in them. The boats that are in there, they're going to proceed in the direction of travel for that particular lane, stay out of the medium strips. Drying traffic at the uh, lanes at the terminals. Again, leave at small angles. A lot of this is no, absolutely no different than what we do on the highway, on a four-lane highway. Again, if we avoid crossing them, if we shall cross at a 90-degree angle. Don't anchor in the separation zones. And again, uh, if we have to stay out of those areas, we do it by a wide margin. And don't impede anybody. Okay, those are the first 10 rules. We went through and what we did is we talked about when the rules are there, they're there to avoid a collision. We talked about the fact that we have inland international rules and the Coregs line of course divides those two areas. We talked about the fact that we're going to be good mariners, we're going to comply with the rules and we're going to use common sense. We talked about a uh, number of definitions, which we're going to come back to many times in the next sets of rules. And we came up with, when we're underway, which means we're not anchored mortar or ground, a set of rules will comply. Lookouts by sight and hearing at all times. If a lookout is going to leave their post, they can only do that when they are properly relieved. We have safe speed, and safe speed is a plan that we can take a corrective action or stop within the prevailing conditions. Visibility, maneuverability, state of the wind, sea, and current, traffic densities were a couple that we talked about, visibility. We know that if we're going to determine if there's a risk of collision by, uh, by watching out the vessels around us, and if we have an approaching vessel which bearing does not change, we know that there's a risk of collision, and we need to take appropriate action. That appropriate action is early, substantial, following good seamanship. And if we make a change, it's going to be large and apparent to the other vessel. Uh, many times, a uh, course change or slowing down speed change can make all the difference. We continue to observe until we're passed and clear. And then we have the narrow channels situation. We know that if we're power driven, downbound, following current, and we tell any upbound boats to place some inner passage, initiate the signals, we have the right away of those upbound boats. The upbound boat's going to hold until uh, we can make safe passage on it. We had our first sound signal. Again, around the bend, uh, if you cannot be seen, we do our prolong. And then finally, we got into our, um, and the other one we got into there was our you know, channel, 
We're not going to impede a boat that has to stay within the channel by crossing, fishing, or anchoring. And then finally, we have our traffic set zones. We're going to stay out of them. We're going to cross those at a 90 degree angle after we let the, the controllers know what we're doing. Those are the first 10 rules. Question I have is, do any of you have any questions? Does it make sense? I need to know if, uh, again, if, if you have any questions or not. If you don't, then I want to proceed to the next one, but I don't want to leave this unless we make sure there are no questions. Everybody with me yet? Okay. Everybody else good? I'm gonna do I wanna do one more section of rules. It is eleven o'clock your time. I wanna go through one more set and then what we're gonna do is take a lunch break, if that's okay. Okay, the next set of rules, what we're going to do is going to be, okay, I'm going to talk about when I can see you. When I can see you, a certain set of rules apply, and it, they're no, absolutely no different than we're on the highway. So if I can see you in these situations, then these conditions apply. If I cannot see you, these rules do not apply. So restricted visibility, again, no different than on a highway. If I cannot see you, there are no right-of-ways. No one is staying on, no one's give way, et cetera. So these only apply when I can see you with my eyes, day or night. Okay. If you have not been a sailor, you're going to be a sailor for two rules for one exam. We have two sailing vessels. Now remember what I said, a sailing vessel is a, a boat with sails up and no motor engaged. Motor is not running. So they're being powered by wind. Okay, so if there's a risk of collision between two sailboats, one must stay out of the way of the other. One, if they're on different tacks, and all that different tacks means is that wind is hitting from uh, different sides of the boats. So here we see the wind coming down the screen. It's on the port tack of one boat and hits the starboard tack of the other boat. You will note it's not the side that the sail is carried on. It's normally the opposite side. In this case, port tack will stay out of starboard tack. Again, these are sailboats. These are not power-driven vessels. Okay. If they're on, the, the wind's on the same side, it doesn't make a difference if it's on port or starboard, but if it's on the same side of both boats, the one to windward keeps out of the way of one to leeward. The reason, reason for that is the one to windward has control of the wind and very easily can cut off the wind from the one that's downwind. If you ever watch sailboat races, they can be some of the most I don't want to say vicious, but they kind of are. They get really uh, very competitive. And to steal the other winds from the other boat is one of the key moves. So in this case, again, the giveaway boat is the one upwind or windward. The one that's downwind or leeward is the stand on boat. If we're on a port tack and there's a boat to windward and we cannot determine what tack they're on, we're just assuming that we're the giveaway. It's that the whole thing about risk of collision, if in doubt, we assume that there is. Okay. I have two boats here, A and B. Who stand on? Let me know. You can give me the chat. Is it A boat or B boat? Who stand on? The, um, the A boat is upwind, right? So B is the downwind boat, which means that it's going to be the uh, stand on the boat. A boat upwind is the giveaway. Okay. So we have our sail. Uh, Rule 11 basically talks about and 12 talks about our sailboats. This one is overtaking. 
And the key part of this is the word any. Any vessel overtaken another shall keep out of the way of the vessel being overtaken. If I'm out there in my kayak and I'm in a no-wake zone and I'm paddling faster than you're motoring, I'm the giveaway boat. Why? I'm a vessel that's overtaking you. It doesn't say anything about power-driven sail, whatever. It says any vessel overtaking another shall keep by the way of the vessel being overtaken. How do we know what's overtaken is? That the stern light, 135 degrees. If we can see the stern light, then I know that we're in an overtaking situation. Again, being overtaken, two vessels shall not... Uh, When we're overtaken, again, our obligations really uh, are completed only when we're passed and clear. As we start passing, an overtaking situation does not turn into a crossing situation. It continues to be an overtaking and passed and clear. And again, it's no different than on a highway. Um, you're out there with your metro and up comes an 18-wheeler. That 18-wheeler's obligation is to uh, pass you appropriately, and its obligation is not completed until you are passed and clear. No different than on the water. No matter the size of the boat, our obligations are not completed until we're finally passed and clear of the other vessel. Who stand on? Basically, the boat in front of you. Many harbor situations, you're stand on to the boat behind you and you're give way to the boat in front of you. So our, our statuses are constantly changing. And as a good mariner, we have to be very conscious both of what's in front of us as well as what is behind us. Who stand on? We got kayakers and um, the power driven vessel. In talking with people as well as looking through the rules, I'm not aware of any rule that really gets you into this situation, except of course they're not once that's not power driven. And I always go back to the fact that it comes back to rule two: common sense. Um, we're going to use common sense not to drive in front of this boat. Power driven vessel is going to use common sense not to run them over. And in many of these situations. Um, we're there. Got to be aware of it. Okay, POWs have no rights. Port tack versus star, uh, starboard tack on, on a sailboat. Overtaking of any vessel. Windward again to leeward for sailboats. Those are all boats that do not have right away. Okay, so we got our sailboats. We have our overtaking situation. The next one we have is our head-on, unless otherwise agreed upon. And if you notice the criteria, two power-driven vessels, reciprocal or near-reciprocal head-on, involving a risk of collision. So if I have two power-driven vessels, reciprocal or near-reciprocal, and there's a risk of collision, all three of those factors have to be met. We turn to starboard and pass port to port, unless we agreed upon it earlier that we're going to do it the other way around. This is the only rule that actually tells you which direction you shall turn. You shall turn to starboard, pass port to port. Power driven, reciprocal, risk of collision. Exist when a vessel is uh, head on or nearly head on. And at night, we're seeing both side lights, massives lined up. Or by day, we see a corresponding um, relationship. If any doubt, we assume a risk exists again and act accordingly. Okay. Stand on vessels, you know what? In both situations, we're, we're going to be going to port, uh, starboard and passing port to port, unless otherwise agreed upon. So we got overtaking, we got head on, and now we have a crossing situation. When two power driven vessels, again we're talking power driven and a risk of collision, the other one to her starboard shall keep out of the way and avoid crossing ahead of the other vessel. So in a crossing situation, we give way to the right and we're not going to. Uh, we're going to do our best not to cross in front of the other vessel. We'll talk about port to port later on. 
um, green lights. So the boat coming up on our starboard side is going to see our starboard light, which is green, which is go. Uh, we're going to see their port light, which is stop. So again, as we turn to starboard and we see those boats, we know that we have to give way to them. The other thing I want to point out, you notice the size of the cones on this. On uh, highways, we do everything about a 90-degree angle. On the, on the water, it's not. So basically, facing forward, if you're turning your head to either side about as far back as you can see, without turning your body, that is the crossing situation. So we run into many crossing situations where we're assuming that they're overtaken, and really they are not. You have to be very cognizant on the water that in the crossing situation is a little bit further back than 90 degrees. So here we have our typical Floridian uh, rush to death. Who's stand on? Well, if we're giving away to our right, this is not an overtaking situation. The bigger boat actually is stand on, the small boat is give way. And if the small boat has any issues or slow down and not taking into account the other boat's position, somebody's going to get killed. And again, we're not aware, we don't watch the situation, again, beyond the 90 degree line angle. A beam. Who stand on? I'm off for starboard side. We're both power driven. The question says there is no law of mass out there. It says power driven. It doesn't say anything about size. But in this case, she has to stay within the channel. There's the channel markers. Even though we're probably about 10 miles out of Green Bay uh, in open water, this boat still must stay within the channel. So again, I'm less than 20 meters. I am not going to impede the passage of this boat. Not because of she has the right of way in the fact of uh, crossing, but the fact that she's a, a big boat that must stay within the narrow channel. Who stand up? And again, in this situation, it's not a head on. We're off of that head on situation. So if we're going to give way to our right, then the pontoon boat in reality is the stand on vessel. And where the other boat, the boat to our left, is the give way. Again, small boats, it's kind of hard to depict. If you think of these as 200 footers, it makes a little bit more sense. Oh, we guys dropped that one off. Because um, I don't think this will play. Nope. Uh, it's a collision. It's an excellent video on a collision in the open water out in the med. And basically... The giveaway boat and the stand on boat, no one took any action and they ended up having a collision. Okay, I used the words stand on and give way throughout the talk. What does that mean? Every vessel which is directed to keep out of the way of another vessel by these rules shall take early and substantial action to keep well clear. Pretty st straightforward. It doesn't necessarily say how we're supposed to do it, but it simply says that we're. If we're a giveaway boat, we stay out of the other boat's way. I'm taking actions, give the way must, if uh, possible, again, crossing ahead of the other vessel. Stand on boat, on the other hand, has really a lot more obligations. It's got to maintain its course of speed. Remember, we talked about um, rule two that we must not deviate from the rules unless uh, immediate danger. Well, our obligation is to main course and speed. So we give the other boat an idea of what we're doing so they can take the appropriate action. That's the first shell. However, the stand-on vessel may take an action to avoid a collision by her maneuvers alone when it becomes apparent to her the other vessel is not taking appropriate action. So this gives us an out where we do not have to maintain course and speed. So if I see another vessel approaching, it's becoming quite obvious. They have no idea what they're doing, and they may result in a risk of collision. I can take an action, not necessarily deviate from the rules, but I can take an action appropriate to minimize the risk of collision. That's the main. However, when the, the other boat is so close that their action alone cannot avoid a collision, we shall take an action at best to avoid a collision. Again, we're back to rule two. So stand on vessel is shall, may, shall. They shall maintain course and speed. They may take an appropriate action when it becomes apparent the other vessel is not. 
again, not necessarily violating the rules, but taking whatever is appropriate. But they shall, at close quarters, take whatever action necessary to avoid a collision. Shall, me, shall. Again, uh, this turns into more of a situation with um, radar, which I'll cover in a little bit here. Uh, we're not turning to port for a vessel on our port side. Basically, you're not going to turn in front of another vessel. Again, um, the only reason I mention this uh, a lot more on, this, on the stand-on is because I get a lot of people that get very confused about it. We may take an action where it becomes apparent. We shall take a an action when we're in close quarters situations, and we need to to avoid a risk of collision. Okay. Except in narrow channels, traffic set zones, and overtaking, we have what is called an open water priority between vessels. And they go in a particular order. Vessel not under command. Remember we talked about this? This is the boat that's broke. It cannot comply with the rules. It can be a jammed rudder. It could be uh, bad fuel. It can just about be anything that, that basically um, makes them in a situation where they cannot comply with the rules. Vessel not under command. Vessel restricting her ability to maneuver. Why? By the nature of her work. She's out there working, divers down, she's not going to abandon her divers, laying out buoys, etc. They're not going to move out of your way. These are the people that are filling the potholes up on the, on the roads. Constraint by draft. Big boat, it's got to stay within the channel. International rules only. Again, constraint by draft is international rules only. It does not exist at all when we talk about uh, inland rules. That We go back to our narrow channel regulations. Engaged in fishing, trawling, but not trolling. Why are they classified as fishing? Because their gear restricts their mobility to comply with the rules. The big trawl out there, uh, pulling big nets behind us, dredges, whatever, is not going to be easily to maneuver. Therefore, it's got the designation of trawling. But not trolling. Trolling is not fishing by rules. Sailing. Under sail, no motor running. A sailboat is only a sailboat when sails are up and the motor's not. If the sails are up and the motor's running, it is a power-driven vessel. Big distinction. The key thing is the motor is not engaged in the operations. Power-driven. Just about everything from my 17-foot canoe with the Mankato 65 to the 1,000-foot uh, Laker that it's out there. These are all power-driven, underway. And the last one we have is our seaplanes on the water. I advise don't pull in front of a seaplane landing, but again, they are the lowest priority. Now, this series here, uh, we call also, we go by the word of new reels, catch, fish, so purchase some. I'm going to tie back on this all our lights, our day shapes, and our whistles. This is going to be that second part of the rules I was talking about, where who, you, who are you, how do I know, and how are, who's got the priority out there. Uh, the rules up to this point basically are rules to tell us how we respond to each other, who's stand on, who's give way, uh, et cetera. From now on, what we're going to do is find out how do I know you are who you claim to be. And again, it's going to be by day shapes, lights, and sounds. So everything's going to come back and we're going to tag onto this. Last rule on this section I want to cover, I'll give away stand on. The uh, red ones give way to the blue one. Why? Wind's on the port side of the red one. Wind's on the starboard side of the blue one. Which boats give way? Well, obviously, the one to the uh, to the right because it's not a sailboat. It's a power-driven vessel. It's a sailboat disguised as a power-driven boat. Windward to leeward, it's windward. The winds are coming towards us. We're on the same tack. Windward gives way to leeward. Head-on, power boat versus a uh, sailboat on our open water priority. Uh, sailboat takes the priority over the um, power-driven vessel. 
Okay, the last one I want to cover, uh, then we're going to take a little bit of a break here, is going to be uh, conduct and restricted visibility. Remember I said that those rules that we're talking about, 11 to 18, are when I can see with my eyes. If I can see with my eyes, no problem. If I cannot see with my eyes, we're in restricted visibility, rule 19 takes over. Applies to vessels not in sight of another when navigating in or near restricted visibility. Remember, darkness is not restricted visibility. Every vessel shall proceed at a safe speed adopt prevailing conditions that are out there. Remember when we talked about safe speed um, so that we can take evasive actions or stop within the prevailing conditions? One of those conditions was visibility. Obviously, restricted visibility eliminates how fast we can travel. Well, our engines are ready for immediate maneuvering. Again, we're in a 100-foot boat um, or bigger, and we have to have our engines engaged so that when we run into a situation uh, where we have to take an action, we have uh, the ability to do just that. Ever vessels have due regards to all the prevailing uh, circumstances and conditions, basically our lookout, safe speed, appropriate action, all those things that we covered uh, in that area. If we detect by radar alone, the following rules apply. So if we have radar and we're restricted visibility, then these rules would apply. So if you have radar in your boats, you really do know, need to know how to use it so you can comply with these rules. If detected by radar alone, the presence of another vessel shall determine if close quarter conditions exist or if there is a risk of collision. So she shall take action of she shall take avoiding actions in ample time provide alter, uh, alteration of the course so far as possible, shall avoid. Basically, it says, we're going to take appropriate actions, but we're going to avoid these particular situations. Altering the course to part for a vessel forward of the beam. So we're out there, and we can determine by radar there's a boat ahead of us, forward of a beam. It's on our port side. We're going to avoid altering course to port. We're not going to turn into them. If we go to continue straight, or turn to starboard, they turn to starboard, we're going to pass each other with no issues. An alteration of course to port for a vessel forward of the beam other than being overtaken. So if boats coming up behind us and overtaking us, we maintain course, they're going to be going uh, either way around us, they're overtaking situation. We're going to avoid altering course towards a vessel, a beam, or a bath of the beam. So if somebody's coming up on our port quarter, we're not turning to port. If somebody's coming up on our starboard quarter, we're not turning to starboard. And then you have the direction restricted visibility wheel here. And again, the idea is that if both, both boats follow the, the concepts, we should avoid a collision. In each of these cases, if the blue arrows follow the same set of rules, we're going to be turning away from each other or going parallel to each other. Okay, without radar, which just tends to be a fair number of us out on the water, except when a risk of collision does not exist, every vessel which she is apparently forward of her beam, a fog signal of another vessel, but which cannot avoid a close course situation with another vessel forward of her beam, shall reduce speed to minimum in which she can keep on course, bare steerage. You hear that word used a lot. Basically, we're going to drop down the bare steerage. We have to have water going over the rudder to make our turns. She shall have to take all the way off in any event uh, navigation extreme caution. I don't like taking all the way off because if you take all the way off, you have no ability to take any corrective action. Bare steerage, proceed with extreme caution. Okay. Rules 11 through 19. The first set of rules. Again, help us define what inland international rules were. And they gave us some criteria that when we're under, uh, we're underway, away from the dock, not mortar ground, that we're going to do. 11 through 19 give us a different set of rules on how we're going to react when we're out there, especially when I can see you. 
First, these rules apply when I can see you. For sailboats, the right of way between two sailboats, or you know, the situation between two sailboats, if they're on different tack, we know that port will give way to starboard. We know if they're on the same tack, windward gives way to leeward. And all this simply means is the side of the boat in which the wind is hitting. We then have our power driven boats. Uh, overtaking, basically any vessel that's always overtaking is always the giveaway. Head on, there is no one that's um, a stand on. You go to starboard and pass port to port. So in head on situation, neither boat is stand on. Crossing situation, we give way to starboard. The boat for starboard is a stand on, the boat to port is give way. Give way stays out of the way. Stand on maintains course and speed, but may, when it becomes apparent, or shall, if there's a risk of collision, take action. Open water priority, not under command, the top one, restricting ability to maneuver by the nature of her work, the second one, constraint by draft, international only, fishing, where the gear is restricting their mobility, commercial fishing in essence, sailing, Sailing again, uh, sails up, no power, power driven, anything with a motor. Seaplanes, and then finally we talked about restricted uh, visibility. Without radar, we're going down to bare steerage and proceed with caution.